Good afternoon, everybody. Judy Maggio with Austin PBS Decibel. And one of the big questions. Oh. Let's pause. Oh. We're not live yet. Oh, thank oh, you. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. So we'll that important step. It's all right. We'll pause it. Let's go ahead and pause that. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. One of the big questions we've had about the COVID-19, this form of the coronavirus, is when are we gonna see a vaccine? Well, in case you didn't know, the University of Texas is at the forefront of this with some of their research. Dr. Jason McClellan is a structural biologist who's been making the rounds of the media because of a breakthrough that you all have had in your lab, and it has to do with mapping. But before we talk about that, Dr. McClellan, Let's just go back to the basics. Sure. I know your team has been doing a lot of research on coronaviruses for yeah. a while. What is a coronavirus? Sure. Uh, so it's a uh, it's an RNA virus. So it's genetic material is made of RNA, not DNA. Uh, the primary reservoir is bats, and so these viruses actually uh, they they infect bats. They exist in bats. They mutate. Um, four of four coronaviruses uh, infect all of us each year. They they're one of the causes of the common cold. And then three big ones have emerged from the bat reservoirs into the human populations and have caused uh, epidemics. And so that was uh, SARS coronavirus in 2002, the MERS coronavirus in 2012, and now the new SARS-CoV-2, uh, which emerged at the end of last year. And we know this as COVID-19, is what we're calling that? The, 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 uh, the population, the, yeah. the non-science population yeah. is calling is that is it the correct thing to call it? The nomenclature uh, was sort of uh, unfortunate. So the, the disease that the virus causes is called COVID-19. The virus that causes COVID-19 is now called SARS-CoV-2. Okay. But, okay, I understand but the But yeah, there has been, so many people just call it COVID-19. Uh, it, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, all right. Novel so, coronavirus, they're all. So when we talk about your work, you all have been working on coronaviruses for some time, mapping them. Explain to the folks watching how this most recent mapping of this particular uh, protein and yeah. this particular virus yeah. could lead to a vaccine. Sure. So maybe a little bit on the, the, the architecture of a, of a virion from coronavirus. Okay. Right? So you have a, it, it's covered in a membrane and inside are the, the genetic components that it needs to infect our cells and replicate and, and cause damage. On the surface of the virion is a large spike protein that looks like a club. It's decorated with these clubs, and you may have seen it in We've some of the- We've seen that. Yeah, it makes with, some of the little, little red, red spikes, clubs. Yeah. yes. It's actually a great image. Um, uh, and, and so, what the spike protein does is it first binds to a specific receptor on the surface of our cells. Okay. And then once it's bound, it undergoes this really dramatic conformational change where it then fuses the host cell membrane and viral membranes together. That allows all the RNA genome of the virus to enter our cells, and at that point we're infected. So the spike causes uh, binding and entry. So it attacks that particular cell. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and so what we want to do is we want to stop the spike from functioning. We either want to stop it from attaching to our cells or stop it from fusing the two membranes. And so either, either one is sufficient to prevent entry. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is trying to understand how does the spike look, look like. So before we would just have a sequence. Uh, and what our group and others around the world have done is uh, for the last several years have been able to determine these high resolution structures of these spike proteins. Like a 3D Like kind a 3D, of we know where every atom is in, in the molecule, we know exactly how it folds, where each amino acid is, and that gives us a lot of information. We can start to point, pinpoint this region is where the receptor binds, this region has to refold. Uh, and with that information, we can then do a lot of rational um, engineering approaches to try and develop interventions for coronaviruses. So in our case, generally what we try and do is, is once we get these spike structures, um, we, we analyze them, we try and make various mutations, substitutions to amino acids to make the proteins more stable, to make them express better in the lab, which can benefit vaccine development. Uh, other groups can take the map and then um, in silico, in their computers, design molecules that bind to it, either proteins or small molecule drugs. Uh, and so 
you know, with the structure that we determined of this newest coronavirus, we've been sending the, the protein and the plasmid that makes the protein, and as well as the, the 3D map, to researchers all over the world. Like every day, 10 to 20 packages and emails You're go busy. out. You're busy. We are super busy. It's taken a lot of work away from the grad students and postdocs, but we think it's really important uh, to share. We don't know, you know, uh, a vaccine, an antibody, a small molecule, these are all different interventions. Uh, we don't know which one's gonna be best. Uh, and so we just want to facilitate the development of all interventions from around the world. So so this is a breakthrough in that it's the first time you all did the first actual mapping of this specific spiked protein That's right. that attacks the human cell. So if you have that makeup of it, I'm, I'm just making yep. sure I understand yep. this. Yep. If you have that makeup, then it will be easier for other scientists to develop a vaccine or perhaps an antiviral medication that people could yeah, take? Yeah, right. So, so these things could be developed in the absence of such information, right? We, we have many vaccines where we didn't have structures when they were created. The structural information allows us to do it in a much more targeted, rational way and, and hopefully much quicker, which in the case of a pandemic is really important to do things as quickly as possible. So rather than screening a million compounds, maybe in silico, you can dock these small molecules to the structure of our protein, eliminate ones that don't bind, and then hone in on the top 100 hits and test only those rather than testing millions. So when you're talking about making this a, a quicker procedure, yep. I think that some of us watching would go, oh, so we'll have a vaccine soon. But the reality is that this type of testing needs to be tested itself yep. many, many times. Exactly. So, so what is, what's a realistic timetable now that we have a map like this, mm -hmm. like yours, and scientists are working more specifically on developing a vaccine? Yep. Are we talking about six months, a year, two years? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Maybe I can take a step back a little yes. bit. So we are actually involved in, in the vaccine development. So the, the molecule we created contains stabilizing mutations that we think make an ideal vaccine. That's based on our work on coronaviruses the last five years or so. And so uh, from the structures of SARS and MERS and other COVIDs, we created a set of mutations that we can introduce into almost any coronavirus spike to make it more stable. Uh, and so for this new coronavirus, as soon as the sequence was posted online uh, by Chinese researchers of the entire viral genome, we, we made this new recombinant protein, stabilized mutations. We determined the structure. Our colleagues at the National Institutes of Health started testing it in animals. And a company called Moderna is now uh, creating an mRNA molecule that will deliver this protein into people. Uh, and so we don't even need to do additional design so much for this one. We, we think we already have a very good vaccine candidate. What happens next is just uh, a year or two of testing, and, and that's required. So you have to do a phase one clinical trial, which is generally tens of people, 30 to 40, different doses, making sure it's safe, there's, there's no side effects. If that looks promising, you go to a phase two, which is in the hundreds of people, also looking for safety, um, maybe some efficacy as well. We're raising the types of antibodies that, that we want to. And then finally, a several thousand person phase three clinical trial, uh, where maybe some portion of the people are getting vaccine, some portion are getting placebo. We're looking to see how well the vaccine is working compared to placebo. And that just takes time. You have to enroll all these people, do this carefully, follow them for weeks or months. Uh, and so the only way to speed it up is to possibly uh, skip safety a, a little bit. And, obviously and we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And there's already enough you know, unfair um, concern about vaccines. And so, of course, we want to make sure we do everything right, make sure it's safe and efficacious. So I think 18 to 24 months uh, is, is, is probable. Uh, a year would be extremely fast. Even one to two years is um, an order of magnitude faster than most vaccines, which take, like, have taken uh, one to two decades to actually develop. So even two years is incredibly fast and would be one of the fastest ones ever made. So your team is not only involved on the front end, uh, being the first to come up with this actual 3D map of the spiked protein yep. and how it infects the cells, but you're also involved with the idea of, of designing a, a vaccine. That's right, yeah. The molecule we, we determine the structure of already contains some of our stabilizing mutations. It's a very specific construct. Um, and so that is the vaccine antigen that's going to be tested by, by the NIH in partnership with one of the companies. Many different companies are, are making different vaccines, but you know, this is the one we've helped create and helped design. And um, so far, apparently, the results are looking promising. 
So other other scientists have mapped, have done this through this type of mapping, but you guys were the first? We were the first, yeah. There was one other group out of uh, University of Washington, David Beesler's group. They also determined uh, a similar map of this. Actually, I think their protein contained our stabilizing mutations we had published on previously. Uh, yeah, so there's been, been two such uh, maps of these molecules. Would the vaccine be a coronavirus, a universal coronavirus vaccine that we, that we might go in and get, or would it be just a vaccine to protect against this COVID-19? Yeah. This one would be fairly specific for this particular okay. coronavirus. Uh, there might be some cross-reactivity to SARS, which was only circulating in like the early 2000s, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't broadly cross-react against the other coronaviruses that we know about. Uh, the long-term goal of my lab, the reason we started working on coronaviruses five years ago is we knew more uh, outbreaks would occur, and, and, and one has, uh, and then we wanted to try and create a universal vaccine or a universal uh, antibody that protects against all coronaviruses, all known as well as those that have yet to emerge. And so that's our long-term goal. That's more in the order of decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, that's what some people are trying to do with uh, influenza. Rather than get this yearly shot, people are trying to make a, a universal flu vir uh, vaccine so you only get one vaccine mm -hmm. and protects you for 10 to 20 years. So we think a universal coronavirus vaccine would, would be fantastic. It's something you could stockpile and you'd be ready uh, for when the next thing emerges. You might already have something ready to go. So the National Institutes of Health um, helps fund your research, and yes. I think people don't realize that there are scientists all over the country, all over the world, doing this type of research. It's just that, who knew that the, this particular one would rise to the top and start causing this outbreak? Of, exactly, of, yeah. I mean, there are tons of scientists like me or, or, or yeah. do different things. Uh, that's why we, you know, the NIH has a huge 30 plus billion dollar a year budget. You need to fund science before you need to know the answers. The research yeah. takes years, and so if you can't start working on a virus right when the outbreak occurs. So uh, we've been fortunate that we've had funding to work on coronaviruses in general. We've understood a lot about spike proteins, how to stabilize them. And so within you know, a, a week of knowing the sequence of this particular coronavirus, we were able to design a vaccine antigen that we felt looked good, determine the structure, have our colleagues begin testing it in animals, um, and that can only be done with just this um, support from, from government funding. I can tell how passionate you are about your work. Yeah, right? it's, well, it's really cool. What do you think are some big misconceptions? Because there's a lot of misinformation out there about COVID-19. People are panicking. Um, as a scientist, what, what do you think um, are those misconceptions that, that you could shed some light on? Not to put you on the yeah, spot. Yeah, no, that's a tough one, because then I have to like validate misconceptions, which is tricky. Um, or is there something I, well, that you just you want never, the average yeah. person to understand about these coronaviruses? Uh, it is a serious virus. Uh, it, it's case fatality rates, uh, the percentage of people um, that die who are infected with it is somewhere between 1% and 4%, which mm -hmm. is higher than the, than the normal seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. It's not as bad as SARS or MERS, which was at 10% to 35%. Uh, it is highly infectious. It seems to be spreading very quickly, human to human. So I think there there is cause for concern. There's never a cause for panic. Um, we don't we don't need to panic. Um, you know, people are working quickly to to develop interventions. A lot of the uh, isolation and quarantining has has bought us time and has helped slow the the spread mm -hmm. of the virus. So I think one big thing is just not to panic. All right. Dr. Jason McClellan and his team at the University of Texas, a structural biologist who is on the front lines here battling the, the COVID-19 and coming up with some ways that hopefully we can not only have a, have a solid vaccine, but perhaps other uh, medications that people could take once they, they do have That's this. right, that's the goal. Right. Very good, thank you so much for sharing your information. Thank Keep you. up the wonderful work. And thank you all for sharing a little bit of your afternoon with us today. Make it a great day.